Hello. Okay. Now we can hear. Okay. So the first question I was going to ask has actually been answered, and it was about your inspiration for these stories. So let me just commend you all, first of all, for the stories that you have written, because they are deeply personal to you. And it takes a bit of courage to kind of expose your own diversity. Really not caring if it's accepted or not, but we thank God that it is. So I really appreciate that. And I will say my first question was sparked by you in the video I saw about you explaining why you wrote A Special Little Girl. Touched my heart, had me in tears. It did that she came home and felt like that, but the way she expressed it was amazing. So let's go to our second question. Okay, so interesting. We have some little ones here. My son is 13, so he's not that little. And if you want to ask a question, sweetie, in the front, be my guest. Yes, see, she's ready, she's listening. You all have a privilege in that your audience is vast and wide because you don't just have an audience of adults or children, you have both. So your books have to be special enough that a parent wants to pick it up and take it home, or that a child sees it in the bookstore or the libraries. You want these books in the libraries? So who do you think is your worst critic? Parents or children? Children. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely children. They are brutally honest. Um, I'm sorry. So if there is um, something that they don't agree with or don't like, they will absolutely tell you. Um, I remember going to a, uh, a book festival, um, and the parent was so excited about uh, getting my books, um, and the, the child was kind of walking around. I think there was a, a, a neighboring author that had... Um, had something that they were giving away <laughs> and the child was more uh, interested in, the, in that item than the book but the, the parent was really trying to sell my book more so than myself um, and the child was like mm -mm, I don't I don't want that and so um, so yeah I found that children are definitely uh, my worst critics thank you so much it's a wonderful question and I think children especially are they're deeply engaged in the content so they are asking questions as they go through the book. They are being challenged. Their own thoughts are being challenged. What they see for themselves are being challenged. And so children, for sure. Most definitely children. So I have a focus. When I'm producing a book, I have a focus group. Um, and the parents will give me their I, you know, their input. But I say, I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear about it from you. I want to hear your children because they're my target market, right? And so they are very, very, very critical. And I definitely take into account what they think. Like for instance, um, with When You Give a Girl a Puppy, I had um, a choice of uh, book covers. And in one of, the, one of the choices, both the little girl and the dog had their eyes closed. And all the parents were like, oh, they, you know, with the clothes and them smiling, it looks like, you know, they're very gleeful. But the children were very critical to let me know, well, dogs don't run with their eyes closed. That makes no sense. And I had to listen. And so as you can tell, the dog does not have his eyes closed because I don't want any child telling them. Dogs don't have their eyes closed. That makes no sense. Sorry, no. So yeah, children are the very, very critical. I love that, that they're so honest. Okay, so now we're getting heavy. Not grim, just a little heavy. So, again, your topics and your characters are very diverse. Have you had any experiences, uh, whether it's in settings like this, where you've gone to different bookstores or book signings, or in publishing, trying to get your stories out, have you experienced any type of negative feedback or comments? because of the diversity of your characters and your stories. Please tell us if you've had that experience. So I love this question. Uh, publishing has so many gatekeepers. So my books are self-published and 
uh, self-publishing wasn't as popular as it is now when I first published the Juris P. Prudence book. And I, init I uh, initially searched for an agent to take on the book and send out, there's a whole process, you send out queries to certain agent or agents around the country. And the feedback was that no one would believe that there was an 11 year old lawyer, but that was the whole point, right? So there wasn't as much pushback, at least explicitly, there wasn't any pushback regarding the color of Juris P. Prudence's skin. She was just, uh, you know, a, on paper, she was described like what she looked like, but a query is just a, a black and white, you know, piece of paper writing your, with the first chapter perhaps of your book. And so the idea was that, you know, no one would believe that this person existed, but that was the whole point of Juris P. Prudence to push kids to believe what wasn't immediately in front of them, push kids to believe that that's possible. So gatekeeping exists for sure. And that's why it's so important to continue to tell our stories whether we publish them ourselves or whether you know we use a publisher uh, because our stories won't be told if someone says no one would believe that i completely agree i think that's the reason why i started with foreign publishing because i feel like our voices are being um forgotten in traditional publishing and yeah, there is some pushback right um i find that books that deal with children of color especially are heavily steeped in reality, realistic fiction. And it's like, the thought is that these are children and we're not allowed to have these big imagin imaginations. And that's kind of sad. I mean, yes, my books are definitely um, have realistic fiction, but we need to have more of our books. These are still children that we're talking about. And I think that when you have creativity in children's writing, creativity leads to ingenuity. And, and you know, and we need to, we need to promote that with children's literature. But also, I find that with, this is something that's not really talked about a lot in traditional publishing, is that there seems to be in traditional publishing a notion that we that we do buy books, right? They're, they're realizing that we do buy books and that there are a lot of book strips that are coming out that have black and brown characters on the cover. But when you really dig deep, they're not written by black and brown people. And that can be disconcerting. So that's why with, especially with Leap Forward Publishing, I'm, it's not just about producing diverse books that have diverse characters, but lending voices to diverse people, making sure that they're the ones that are telling the stories and that are writing the books. So yeah, that's why, yeah. Uh, I'll just add that um, for my books specifically because of the nature of uh, actually the, the subjects of each of the books, um, specifically with um, Sun You Matter, uh, there has been, I have received some, uh, some criticism as a result of just the content in general, specifically in the school system. Um, schools are, are sometimes apprehensive to allow me to read this book. I, and I understand it because they don't want to, you know, uh, broach those subjects around in, uh, inequities of policing and communities of color. Um, they're afraid that, you know, the children are going to ask questions, and they do, <laughs> uh, and they should, exactly, around um, those inequities. And so uh, they've been more apprehensive to allow me to read this book. Um, that's not all schools. Uh, certainly, uh, many schools have embraced it. Um, but there have been some that have said, no, we don't want that one. We can't. We can't. It's a great book. We just can't allow you to read that to our, our students. Um, and then for a special little girl, um, I've received not a lot, but some criticism regarding the credibility of the voice of the book, since I am not uh, on the spectrum myself. Um, but I have lived experience. When I say that I mean lived. Um, so my, my sister, my family, and I've had to navigate um, the, the services that are provided uh, and the lack of services that are provided to children, specifically children of color that are on the spectrum. And so there is some credibility there. And I tried not to be as specific with what that difference was that we spoke about in the book um, to kind of make it more broad uh, since I am not on the spectrum. Um, but we know that in reading the book that there is some difference that the um, the main character has. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's been my experience with criticisms. 
interesting and that touches on the next question that I want to ask. Debbie, you touched on it. You also touched on it. Do you have a dinner with your brother? Uh, Uncle Colby. <laughs> That's what we're going to be today. Um, and that is, do you, again, I said I was getting happy, so no disrespect to anybody here that is not of a certain persuasion, but do you believe that people of a different color can write the stories of black and brown children or their experiences? And I asked that question because not only did you bring up that sometimes we open the book or we look at the back and see the author and it's not the entire book or novel is about an 11 year old black boy. And then you see the, the author and it's like, hmm. You also mentioned that, you know, the credibility of whether or not you're speaking because you're not on the spectrum. And I wonder if we maybe have an unconscious bias that you can't tell those stories. What what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think that you can tell the stories. It, it happens all the time, as uh, Deborah alluded to, like authors of various backgrounds writing uh, books that feature characters of color uh, and their experiences. So I think that it, you know, you can write the book. Now, again, it speaks again to the credibility of the voice. The lived experience makes a difference. Um, and so uh, while, you know, we have other um, ethnicities, if you will, writing books with characters of color and talking about their experience, not having that lived experience, um, I think takes away from um, the the substance, if you will, of the, of the, the book. And so to answer your question, yes, they can. Um, but I think that there's, there's, some, there's something a bit more impactful um, for an individual of color. If I, for me to write a book, like a sudden you matter having had to go through a, an experience with a, a, a white police officer and being stopped unjustly without cause, but because I drove a certain vehicle or was driving in a certain neighborhood, I was stopped um, based on the color of my skin. My white counterparts don't have that lived experience. Many of them don't have that lived experience. And so I think that I can give voice to, to that experience more so than they, uh, they can. And so, yeah, that's me. Thank you so much. <laughs> me. So I think it's so important that when we tell stories, whether we tell them from our own vantage point or the vantage point of someone else, that they're so carefully researched, that we do it in a way that is thoughtful, diligent. So <laughs> pardon me. If we're telling the stories from, if I'm telling the story of a girl who is black from 1865, I want it to be authentic. Um, my, and, and I do think that people who are not black can tell black stories or stories of black people, but we're not monolithic. We are very diverse. So the story that you tell, it has to be researched. It has to be authentic. And it has to be careful not to inject biases stereotypes that perpetuate narratives that are dangerous and so it's much easier for me to write about jurisprudence this 11 year old lawyer a black girl who spends a lot of time with her grandparents who's a dreamer who's smart that was my lived experience growing up i did live uh you know with both of my parents they were divorced uh, at a young age uh none so that this was an authentic story easy for me to tell and i was not as, it, it, I didn't have to do as much research about this character. <laughs> Nonetheless, if there was another character that I was writing about, I would just be so careful because we have to be, what we give out to kids, <laughs> it can't be negligent. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, think, I think that they can write stories that, you know, there's so many books that you see that have a black and brown character on the cover or in the book, but it's not necessarily culturally relative to black and brown people. It's just kind of generic. Um, when you give a girl a puppy, it's not about a black girl. It's just a kid that has a dog just happens to have a black girl on the cover. But with Zora and the Very Big Question, that was very particular in that people think, well, what's the 
big question and it's a little girl who who gets um her teacher asks the class what do you want to be when you grow up but that's not the very big question the very big question is what can i be and it's based on the fact that um black and brown children aren't they aren't inherently born knowing that they can become anything as other ethnicities you know do believe that so how do you write that? How are you a person, not a person of color, and write from that perspective? When you when you grow up thinking that you can become anything. It's just now, recently, that children believe that they can become president. Why? Because a lot of these kids were now living in an era where there was a black president, so they believe that. Um, so yes, and if you're going to write a story that has that's culturally relevant, you need to do your research, because how do you, I mean, I see some of these books, and I'm just like, how did, how did how did you how did you how so yeah okay so we know there is this concerted effort in the united states to ban certain books these books seem to either be about black or brown people people of color or written by people of color what a coincidence huh um so we know that that exists what also exists is follow my careful words here, is not that there are more books written by and about people of color, but there's a push to expose what is already there and what has been there, it just is. At least in my world, I have always seen black and brown authors, and people of color. I've always seen people of color in literature. And that just happens to be my background, how my parents exposed me or my community. However, do you believe that the push to expose this area of literature is counteracting or balancing these bans? And if not, what needs to be done, I would say, in the communities of color who know about this literature, what needs to be done to make sure, and by the way, let me point out that the ban is not in stores like this. So you can still buy these books for your children, but you just may not be able to find them in libraries or schools, so you still buy them. But do you believe that uh, that push to expose, you know, diversity in literature is counteracting these bans, and if not, what needs to be done? Well, first of all, I think that when you particularly ban, when you ban a specific book, I think all you're doing is creating more buzz around the book. Because if I see a book that's banned, now I want to know why it's banned. Okay, if if, if um, so, you matter. If if I found out that that was, I want to why is this banned? It make, it creates the curiosity, and I think that then that drives the popularity. Um, stores like this will then want to carry even more. Um, so I don't know the people who are banning these books. I don't think they're very smart in their in their in their process of trying to do so because they're just creating more of a buzz for people to want to buy it. And I agree with the when we can't get something, we want to know more about why. For sure, I do think it is extremely dangerous to ban books in entire states when the library is often the outlet for new worlds. And to go to a bookstore is a privilege, to buy a book is a privilege. And so it's not, uh, there is a, I love bookstores growing up and my parents took me to bookstores on Friday nights. That's why I wanted to go to Books A Million and Barnes and Noble. Um, and those were the places that I loved. And we had a budget for books. So I couldn't get all of them, I could get one or two but that was a privilege. And so I am still so fearful of the fact that uh, we have these bands in entire states where kids will not be able to read about true history and to dismiss that history. And you can only get that history when you are, you know, have the ability to buy a book or if there's a free little library or um, you, know, you know, where you can actually, if we have them in DC and they are around the country where people do donate their books, uh, but the access to storytelling is something that I think we should all be talking about. We should all really realize that, you know, there is privilege in buying books and not everyone has access to that. 
Was that the privilege is privilege and by both it definitely is. And I like that you talked on or spoke on the fact that you know how your parents exposed you to books. Uh, what do you believe would be a great way to reach those who may not have this type of literature at their disposal? And when I say that, I'm thinking of, you know, this is Washington, D.C., okay? Sort of kind of still trying to say, but, you know, we may have grown up in or we live in now uh, communities where we can get access to this. You know, I live in Maryland, my son's 13, we can come to San Cole for books and just walk around and he's just gonna say, I mean, when we walked in here, you know, you all were speaking and he has this great ability to pay attention to multiple things at once, his brain is like that, but he's he was listening to you all and then he started to just look around and I appreciate the fact that he can look around in a store like this and just see black, brown, people of color, black, brown. Uh, Baba Dick Gregory sitting here looking over us as we have this discussion. I love that. How do you think we can get this type of experience or this type of literature to those places where, and I'm not just speaking of black and brown children who don't live in diverse communities or don't live in black or brown communities, but even white children to expose them to this literature because it's amazing. Like you said, if you give a girl a puppy, it just happens to be a little black girl that gets a puppy. Any child would love to read about that. So how do we make this push to do that? <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned that because that is something that I speak about very, very often. One of the quotes, I'm gonna just read it. One of the quotes that I have, I I put it in every book, is that representation is not only important to ensure that children see themselves in the world, but so that all children see, learn about, and appreciate those who are different from them. And that to me is, that's my signature line, right. It's so very important because, you know, great, we have these books that, um, that motivate and empower our children, but that does nothing really to narrow the divide. Children, of all other ethnicities and races, they need to see these books as well. Because if they're, you know, when children are exposed to diverse books at an early age, they learn to appreciate the diversity in the world. And so then when they, as they grow, we won't have to say Black Lives Matter anymore because they'll already know that it matters. And that to me is really important. I was once doing a book signing, I won't name the story because it's not St. Kofa, but I had a, I had, had a white parent pick up my book and say, oh, um, you know, my sister who works in a predominantly black neighborhood for predominantly black school district, she would love this book. And I said, well, where, what school does your child go to? And she told me, I said, well, why can't the kids in her class appreciate this book? Because I think that it's just as important for them to read this book and to normalize seeing black children on the cover because we were in, engrossed in that with white children on the cover for years, right? That was the norm. And so we need to take away that being the norm and have children of all ethnicities be on the, on the cover and it all be accepted and not be something that's, oh, wow, this is a black book. Because unlike you, Kim, I, I, I didn't grow up with seeing a lot of black children on the cover of books. My first exposure was A Snowy Day, which happens to be written by a white man. Um, or Mufara's Beautiful Daughters, which I saw up there, which was like one of my favorite books in the entire world. But I didn't grow up seeing children, uh, black children on the cover of books, which was sad. So, yeah, I think that, that it, we need, it needs to be normalized. And all children need to see these books to appreciate, to, to appreciate the diversity in the world. And that, I'm double clicking on everything that Deborah said because it was so well articulated and so just so wonderfully said, Deborah. The thing, I did not grow up seeing black girls on books and especially not black contemporary girls. So I love the school book fair. Do y'all remember Scholastic oh, book yes. fairs? <laughs> and do you remember, Amer my LS, do you remember American Girl Dolls? Yeah. 
So I talk about this frequently, but Addie was the one black girl in the American. She was the first. She was the only black I mean, but from the very beginning. Exactly. Exactly. The only. Yeah, exactly. Hi, so hi. Uh, so she was the only black girl in this collection, and I yearned. There were only like six or seven books in her collection, and I just read through those so quickly. But when you went to the Scholastic Book Fair or to the library, you didn't see that was all you saw. And she was a slave girl, and so she read, learned to read. That was her triumph story. She escaped slavery, but what about? the stories of black girl joy having a puppy, not being separated from your parents at nine years old, not being, uh, you know, having to look, you know, having to go through the horrors of slavery and family separation. What about the stories of triumph? And those are the stories that I don't think are being told enough. And I'll just tell you my age, I'm 38. And so, I, I, you know, I, I'm in a post um, you know, 1964 generation, right? And so the stories that were there in 1990 were still so limited for Black girls. And these stories are of the hu are human stories. These are not Black stories. There's a Black character who's a protagonist. And what does Black girl protagonism mean is very important in how we even see ourselves, right? So being able to shape a narrative, being able to shape outcomes, being able to take authority. And so Addie, while she was amazing, I love my American Girl collection or my, my Addie collection specifically, and I love who she represented, still her ability in life was dictated by 1865 and that I needed more stories that told a broader story of the Black girl experience. I would say yes, and um, I, I too did not grow up um, where there were major characters of colors on books that um, I kind of engaged with. You mentioned Scholastic, that brought back a ton of memories uh, because I used to, used to sell pizzas <laughs> trying to, to get money for, for the book fair. I love that book fair. But um, you also, I think there was a part of your question that mentioned um, like promoting the access to, to some of these books. And so I think it's uh, important that we partner with organizations that promote literacy. There's a or great organization called Reading Partners uh, here in the area. Uh, actually, it's a national organization. So I think it's, um, and they work primarily in uh, communities of color. Um, and so I think it's important that we partner with organizations like that that promote getting diverse books in, in the hands of of our children, not just children of color, but all children, but specifically children of color, uh, because there is this access issue that we are faced with. Um, also, I would just um, encourage us to, to continue to support our local black home bookstores, Barnes and Noble, book, my books are there, so certainly go and buy them there. But I do think that it's, it's incredibly important that we support uh, the same cultures of the world, I think, um, because they are promoting our books where other uh, uh, stores or uh, companies are are banning our books and, and not pr uh, providing us the access uh, that's been afforded to us in these types of spaces. So I, I just want to reiterate that it is incredibly important that we support uh, these spaces. Did you? Who's in the so there's another organization, we need diversebooks.org, which is really great. I know that for me on my on my on my Newport website, if you purchase a copy, a specific copy for donation, I donate to that every month because they donate a large amount of books um, to underfunded schools and marginalized areas. And it's a, a really great organization that, that provides access. Like you said, access is so important. Access um, to diverse books where it's needed the most. So it's interesting that you told the story about the lady and you said, well, what about your child's school? Have you ever experienced anything where you had to kind of pull somebody to the side or just put a little bug in their ear that actually we, we do know how to read and write? And <laughs> by the way, um, have, or, or just in encountering maybe an artist um, and you wanted something illustrated a certain way 
or anything like that in this industry where you found that you had to unfortunately explain why it was why it was important? Yes, I would say yes. I mean, like with Zora, the very big question. There was, I was, had to be. You have to be very culturally sensitive to some of the illustrations. And I know that there's one scene in particular with Zora, and um, it's explaining what lawyers do. That lawyers are stand up for people's rights. And the particular scenario was in which Zora um, was playing a board game with her best friend Dawn and their neighbor Julian, and. Julian wanted to take an extra turn that wasn't his. And so Dawn stood up, sorry, uh, Zora stood up for Dawn and said, wait a second, no, 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 that's Dawn's turn. It's not, it's not your turn. And that's how she kind of understood how standing up for someone's rights felt. And the illustration was, was Zora with her best friend Dawn and Julian. And the illustrator had initially did it where like Julian, who was uh, drawn as a white, a white boy was pointing his finger at Zora in a very accusing kind of way, and she was just like this. And I was like, "Oh, that's not gonna, that's not gonna do well. That's not gonna do well." That this little white boy is pointing in an accusing way at this black girl with her brown best friend. And I said, "We need to rethink that at that illustration and make it, um, yeah, make it a little bit more friendly." And so she, right? So we had to work. We had. She and I had to go back a few times in revision to work on that. But then also, like, you know, I've, I've worked with illustrators that are not necessarily of this, from this country and are not exposed to people of color on a regular basis and kind of guide them through how do we, you know, the hair needs to not, you know, have a little texture to it. Um, the noses maybe need not be so straight. And let's, let's, you know, it has to be representative of us and culturally sensitive to us so that we don't offend anyone. So, um, yeah, that's been my experience. So, and the same, I think, with illustrations. Uh, that is where I have had to, uh, they're very intentional with what's depicted on the covers. Uh, I, it's, feedback is awesome because the first jurisprudence was very, it was very artistic, but I wanted something to really capture the emotions and really bring in a, ch a child. So. JP, she, uh, I was talking to someone who was advising me at the time, and they said, well, give her some chucks. She has on some tennis shoes, but give her some chucks. She's in DC, she's 11 years old, that's what she would actually like. Her, my illustrator, it was really uncanny. The first, I've worked with several illustrators, but the illustrator who did this particular illustration, he, I gave him a sketch, uh, but I don't, and I don't know if he had Googled what I look like, but he gave JP's hair texture, so I didn't really have to do that. Um, and so I, but I have gone back and forth with illustrators about what kids would look like and to make sure that the, the diversity that I intended for my books to have, that my photos and, and that my illustrations reflected those. And a lot of uh, times I've given childhood pictures of me, this is what, that JP should look like here. This is what this character should be inspired by. Yeah, for me, um, it was very important that I worked with um, an illustrator of color um, and one that I had some level of familiarity with. Um, and so um, the individual that did both of the illustrations in my book, uh, India, um, Shana out of Charlotte, um, she got it. <laughs> she understood. And so I didn't have to do tons of um, ex explaining. Uh, regarding kind of what I, I wanted to see specifically in Sun You Matter, you'll notice that the there, uh, on the illustrations there aren't any faces. That was intentional. She and I went back and forth uh, regarding that. It was intentional because we wanted people to be able to see themselves in this this situation as it could happen to any of us, right? And so um, as children would read, um, and I get questions and that never fails everywhere I go they're like why aren't why don't the characters or the pictures have any faces to them and it's because we want you to see your face and we want you to put yourself in this this situation how would you react so it, 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 it sparks more questions and more conversation um, but um, again I think that it's important as you're working with illustrate illustrators and 
uh, folks to support your the, the uh, production of your work, um, that there's some level of, at least for me, some level of familiarity um, there, some level of understanding of really of your vision and the intent behind uh, writing your books. Interesting. Okay, so I'm going to get a little bit personal. It's about to get a little lighter in a second. Just a couple more questions. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing and being a little vulnerable, did you ever have any type of fear, or any type of anxiety or trepidation about telling any of these stories? Did you, did you sit back one day and say, maybe I should change this or maybe I should alter that? And if you didn't, then Good for you. Come to the people. <laughs> I'll just say that I didn't have fear per se. I think that I, I tell people all the time I don't have the traditional author's journey. I did not set out to become a children's book author. Um, it was not something that I was versed in. I, I have a workforce development background. I work in the nonprofit community uh, doing macro social work and community organizing. And so that's what I know, right? And so. Um, but like I said, I just really had to to get out my thoughts behind the whole George Floyd ordeal. I ended up reading my uh, story or what was a poem uh, about my nephew. I ended up reading that to my sister the next day. And she said, you absolutely need to turn this into a children's book. Um, and I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. I ended up reading it to a few uh, other friends and they literally confirmed what she uh, encouraged me to do. And so really my book was written, illustrated, and published in 30 days, which wow. is really unheard of. Wow. Really unheard of. I didn't have a marketing strategy. I didn't know, know anything about developing a marketing strategy for a book. Um, but th th just the, it's almost as if the sky opened up as a result of me kind of stepping out on faith, if you will, and writing the book. Attorney Van Crump, who, uh, as many of you know, was the attorney for the, the Floyd family, caught wind of a, a news briefing that I had done, and he began to promote the book uh, on his social media. Michael Jackson's son, Prince Jackson, began to promote the book. And so I say all that to say that, hey, even if you have fear, even if there's just uh, some semblance of doubt, do it. Do it afraid, <laughs> right? Do it scared because you never know the opportunities that will be afforded to you if you step out on, on faith. Absolutely. I mean, everything that everyone is saying is just so on point. And when you are writing a children's book, you are coming from a place of vulnerability. When you're putting your thoughts out to the world, it is scary because not everyone is going to buy your book as a self-published author and even as a hybrid published author. You know, it's it's hard for people to believe in. Okay, well, that's, that's a cute little thing. That's what people used to tell me. That's a cute little thing you're doing. I was, I still am a practicing lawyer, and so I left. I mean, this is very vulnerable, but I left a large law firm really with the intention of writing, and was really ready to say I'm not practicing law anymore. But I did love practicing law, and this is not a cheap endeavor to publish your own books. Very expensive to get illustrations and all of that. Um, but I also very much love publishing. But in legal world, in the legal world, it's a very traditional world. And I believe, again, so Kimberly, you're a lawyer. Deborah's a lawyer. And so to tell people that you're doing something that's non-traditional, it's scary. And I was very, my author identity is one that I didn't even accept for many years. And people, my friends would say, oh, Jessica, you're an author. And I would say, no, not me. I just, you know, I wrote a couple books, but not, I'm not an author. So I, I mean, really recently is when I've actually also identified as an author and a lawyer because I love writing. And so you have to get past your mental blocks when you are, and, and really walk in that identity. And so I think what, for telling JP's story, she is a dreamer. She would never say, oh, I just wrote a couple little books. She would really be, yes. she would be like, oh, I did that. And so for me, it was very important not to put any imposter syndrome in JP because it's so important that we tell stories of black, powerful girls that aren't, you know, limited by the world. The next book that's coming out, she is tackling imposter syndrome and she is really taking it head on because she is dealing with that very real voice in the back of your head that says, well, are you sure you're ready? And I think a lot of us go through that, especially when you're a creator. 
are you sure you're ready? Do you want to put this out to the world? You know, getting on social media and doing video, that's kind of, that is scary. People critique and say all types of stuff. And so you have to make sure that you don't let that, those limiting voices get in the way of putting your words out that really could change a life. Very well said. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say that, you know, Black female attorneys only, we're only what, 2% of the population and I got three of us right. So we need to applaud, we need to applaud that, right? Um, but I totally agree with you. I, I was, been an attorney for 18 years now and I was a litigator for many of that. Um, been writing since I was six and was always trying to figure out how to make that transition from being a litigator to being um, a writer. And it was, a, it was actually a women's empowerment summit that I went to where someone, I asked that question in the, in the room and I can't remember anything of what the moderator said, but someone tapped me on my shoulder, handed me a post-it note that said, stop thinking of yourself as a lawyer that just happens to write and think of yourself that, as a writer who just happens to be a lawyer, change your mindset. By doing that, like will attract like, and then you will find yourself immersed in the writing space with writers. And that changed everything for me. So I wrote, I just, after, soon after that, I started going to writing workshops and I started to join writers groups. And I wrote Zora the Very Big Question. And my husband challenged me. He said, okay, you wrote that. What are you going to do with it? I was, I was like 40. 3, 44 at the time. He said, what are you going to do with this? Are you, you've been griping since you were 40 about, about your life and doing the things that you're passionate with. He's like, so are you just going to shove this in a drawer? Are you going to forget about it? And then in four years, you're going to be like, oh, I love this book and I didn't do anything with it. He's like, it's been four years since you turned 40 and you could have become a doctor. You could have <laughs> gotten a PhD. You could have started a Fortune 500 company. You could have done so many things and you didn't do anything with it. He's like, how about we, I'm going to say it nicely, poop it, get off the pot. He goes, how about we take that leap forward and just actually do it? And that's the reason why the company is called Leap Forward Publishing, because he pushed me and encouraged me to take that leap and just forget about your age and forget about your fears and forget about all those things that are self-doubts, right? All those self-deprecating thoughts and just do it. And just like, like, like Derek said, do it for me. Think, oh yeah, just but just to just do it, and so that's what I decided to do. And to just forget about everything, and I, now I can actually proudly say, yes, I'm a lawyer. Yes, I'm practicing. I have a, my own law firm, you know, intellectual property. But I am a writer. Just happens to be a lawyer. And as far as I'm concerned, my law firm is my side hustle, <laughs> and that this is this is it. This is life. This is it. This is all it is. So yeah. Okay, just a couple more questions. We're going to get your question in just a second, sir. We have two more questions. So this is a two-part question. Um, can you give the audience a sneak peek as to what you may have coming up? And I know you said you mentioned something, Soror, about uh, uh, JP. <laughs> um, and also, is there a topic or story that you would like to tackle uh, that, you, that you may be looking at also? So one of the two or both, well, two-part question. So um, I do this uh, weekly series, YouTube series called Storytime with Uncle Colby, uh, because I found that a lot of um, authors don't have a platform, specifically authors of color uh, that are independent um, uh, authors. They don't have a platform to share their work. Uh, and so I get permission from them to, to read their books. I like to, to say that it's um, uh, similar to like Reading Rainbow. Um, but a, a bit more of a modern spin. And so we talk about relevant themes, leadership, how do you tackle fear? Um, how do you deal with bullying and things like that? Um, and then we feature a book um, that uh, ties into that main theme. Uh, but it is a weekly uh, series that I do. Um, I travel uh, really across the country spreading this message of, about uh, inclusivity uh, in literature. Um, really tackling the, the topics around neurodiversity, uh, which I am incredibly passionate about because of my niece. Um, and then I am working on a, a third book, um, and it's going to be centered around my nephew KJ. So um, when he was born, he was also born with hip dysplasia. 
um, and they didn't know it until six months in, and so he had to wear a cast on both of his his legs, and by wearing that cast, it caused him um, to be immobile for a while, so now he's learning how to walk, um, and so he... Uh, <laughs> He, but he, he so he can't walk, but he loves to dance, right? And so there's there's something about the joy that music brings to us. And so when when my my mom picks him up and she plays, uh, I can't even remember the song now, but it's one of the uh, some Earth, Wind, and Fire song that she loves, right? And he loves as well. And so when that song comes on, his little face lights up and he's just dancing. Um, and so the book is going to be around around that. And I love these stories of black boy, black girl joy. And so we have to tell them, we have to make sure that every kid knows they're entitled to joyful moments. So thank you for putting that out there. So I am writing President Prudence, JP Leads the Country. And it is a book that I am delayed in publishing. And I have been working and working and working trying to get, to get this done. Uh, but I just really want it to just give justice to the story that it's intended to tell. And it's about JP. She's running for the president of the United States. Her nemesis, Sly Sullivan, she gets wind of it <laughs> because there's something that happens in this book. Uh, so this is the prequel uh, to President Prudence. JP leads the country. The cover is down here uh, to my uh, to my right. And so uh, JP is really tackling this question of am I ready to be the youngest president of the United States? And what do I have to internally and externally go through to make that happen? So that is certainly in the works, and I'd, I'd love for it to come out this year, but it's, it's slated to come out next year, uh, next President's Day. And then I'm also, uh, it's always been a dream of mine to see JP on the big screen, and that's something that I, uh, I mean, I am still in its infancy stage, but I'm actively working with a lawyer to option the rights to JP. So. Don't know where that will go, uh, but we are making some headway. So I would love to come back and tell you all that JP has been picked up by a major platform uh, soon, uh, but still in, we're in our infancy stages, but I'm actively working with an attorney to make that happen. Isn't that what, something that we discussed our first time ever there talking? I told her immediately, I said, you know, if anyone is familiar with Dr. Stuffins, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the lawyer version of Dr. Stuffins, and it should definitely be out there. Um, so I'm writing, I, I've written so many stories of myself as a child, and they're all relevant, because I, I think I'm very fortunate in that I remember very vividly the things I thought about as a child. And I think it's important as a children's book author to be able to tap into that. Um, so I, I wrote a story a long time ago about um, the fact that I used to be painfully shy as a child. I would hide behind my mother and my hands would get all sweaty, my throat would get dry and whatnot. And my mother, as Jamaican mothers do, yeah. declared when she came home that that was, she had enough of that and she was putting me in dance class and that I, she was going to get me out of the shyness. And I was completely mortified. And when I got to class, but when I got to the dance class, I thought that I would just have to, you know, I could just kind of, kind of shrink into the background and just do whatever. And I remember the dance teacher said, okay, I want everyone to, you know, when I call your name, sashay to a spot and tell me a little bit about yourself. And I remember screaming internally, because I was like, first of all, what the hell is a sashay? <laughs> Secondly, my mother didn't tell me how to speak. I just thought I had to dance, which I love to do in my room by myself. Then, so I, it's, it, so this story is all about the anxiety that this character, and I don't know what she's going to be named yet. I thought it was going to be Zora. I don't think it's going to be Zora. That's a whole other story. But um, it's the anxiety that she felt and how she was able to navigate that that day, and it ends very you know triumphantly that she her, her father explains to her what. Yeah. Oh, but being brave means, and it's overcoming your fear because on the other side of fear can be good things. It can learn something new and you can make a new friend. And she discovers at the end that that is very true, but it's just that dealing with that initial anxiety and wanting to, you know, become invisible or run away or stuff like that. Um, Cause I want to teach children 
that it's okay to be brave. It's very important to, it, so that we can maybe squash that imposter syndrome from young. And if my mother never did that, maybe I wouldn't be able to sit up here right now and have this conversation because I would be mortified. But, you know, she created a monster, but that's the, <laughs> the litigator, right? <laughs> can I just add one yeah. more thing? So I forgot to mention that I also last year launched a nonprofit called Friends of Zion. Um, that is, uh, of course, named after my niece, uh, but we conduct research and provide resources to children of color and their caretakers uh, that have been diagnosed with autism or other neurodivergent disorders. Um, because we found, as I mentioned, that there was only one organization that supported children of color. And while there are a host of organizations that uh, center around autism and providing resources, again in quotes, uh, providing resources to our children. Um, the reality is a lot of those services and supports don't get to the people that need them the most. And so we're a national organization that will connect caretakers, caregivers, if you will, to real resources. These are vetted resources all across this country, uh, real connections. So you're not just gonna get a cold call, you're gonna have a call, cold, cold, cold number, excuse me, um, of an individual that has no clue who you are, um, but these are real vetted resources uh, for parents um, that that need you know help with whatever the full gamut of uh, what you can uh, face as a, with a child that's on the spectrum. That's great. I'm going to share that. Yes, also, I read sure. that in your bio. I'm going to share that organization with two of my friends that have children on the spectrum. Uh, last question. Very light here, and then it's your turn, sir. Um, so if there is someone deceased or living that you could have break bread with and have a conversation with, who would that be and why? If you can take a moment. This is like, I find that whenever I ask this question, whenever I ask this question of anyone, just in casual conversation or it, it takes a minute. So I'm fine because it's a loaded question and you might have to think. And there might be many choices, if you're like me. Yeah, try to narrow down. I keep going back to actually two people and their family. It's my grandmother, like my two grandmothers. You knew, you knew I was going to say that, right? Um, Summer Island came very quickly to me and I really feel like she was guiding me because I kind of, I, the idea of writing about my summers in the Caribbean, just that was never on my on my list of books to write. And I actually woke up one morning and just wrote it, just wrote it. And I said, she must have been guiding me somehow. And it, but it's resonated to so many people who are first generation Americans. Um, I was recently in Canada and to so, and like over 50% of the black population there is of Caribbean heritage and it really resonated with them. And there's so many questions that I have about our family story that I would love to sit down and talk to her about. Unfortunately, she passed a very long time ago, 40 years ago, actually. But her and my other grandmother, my mom's mom, I would just love to just sit down and just talk about all those stories. And, you know, I, I, as a person who is like the only person in my family who writes, I have, I think it's important to be the storyteller and to be the, the, the keeper of those, of the history of our family. And that's why these books are so important to me because these are books that generation after generation, they can go back and they can say, oh, this was, look, this, this is where we're from. This is who we are. And um, yeah, those are the people that I would wanna to talk to, hands down. Deborah, it's so interesting that I'm reading the back of your book and then when you were reading your book, that you named your grandmother Granny because that's the same name that I that I called my grandmother. I call her Granny. And I'm, I'm not of Caribbean descent, but my book is dedicated to my grandmother, uh, to Josephine Crowell, my Granny, who always reminded me that I was her horse, even if I never won a race. That's what she would always tell me, and I try to honor her in every way that I can. Um, her, she passed away in 2019, trying, not going to get emotional. I didn't know this, so or Kimberly, that you were going to hit us with these deep questions today. Uh, but she passed away in 2019, but I'm so blessed that I started writing this book 
uh, when she was alive. She could see this book actually come to life, published. And I lived with her in law school for the final year, so she really has seen my entire journey in my career. She was able to see that before she passed away. And why that meant so much to me was because she grew, she died within a three mile, five mile radius from where she was born. And so she didn't really see the world in any real, she didn't see the globe the way I've seen it. Uh, but she saw this book come to life and saw me graduate from law school. So I would love to have a conversation with her about this progression, uh, about just life in general. Because when you talk about fear, I think that the person that I have so much admiration for is a Black woman growing up in the South in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even now, right? So that is a person who's overcome and really had to tackle fear. Uh, and so I really try to honor her in every single way that I can. And just the last funny story about my grandmother, she was just a funny woman, would say whatever came to her mind. And I was interviewing her right before she had her stroke. I just took some video of her. And we were just talking about her life when she was cognizant uh, when she had her stroke. You know, she suffered from some uh, the brain injuries. And she said, you know, your book, you use my name and you've made a lot of money off of me. And I want my cut. And I was like, Granny, I'm allowed to make all of money, but... One day I hope that, you know, these books, everyone, the world will see her name, Josephine Crowell. So I do honor her. I'm definitely going to round it out with the grandmothers because uh, my grandmother, along with my mom, they raised me. So I was raised by mostly single women. Uh, my dad was, wasn't in the picture until later on, much later on in my life. Um, but I can recall, and I, I share this story fairly often, but I can recall growing up, I was in um, grade school, elementary school, um, and the teachers diagnosed or tried to diagnose me with a learning disorder. Um, it was not because of my inability to learn information, but really based on my speech. I am from the South, very deep South, from Gainesville, Florida, by way of Montioka, Florida. <laughs> um, so it's real country. <laughs> um, and I speak really fast when I am excited. I do that to this day. <laughs> so when I'm excited, so you have that, the, the quick speech coupled with a, um, a really big Southern drawl, if you will. Um, and so the teachers were like, what is he saying? Like, what is going on? Like, and so they tried to diagnose me uh, with a learning disorder. But what we found was that many of the children of color that they didn't know how to teach were being placed in these special education classes. Um, and so you had kids that had behavioral issues um, that were placed in the, these classes. And that was really, that set them up for the rest of their lives. Many of them that were in these classes were in special education courses uh, throughout um, the trajectory of their learning experience. And so um, I had fortunately had a mother and a grandmother that did not play that. They, they were like, no, there is nothing wrong with him. He just needs to slow down. <laughs> and so they made me slow down. And what happened was they ended up removing me from that school that tried to place me in these special education courses. Um, and I went to another school where I was placed in advanced courses. Um, and I was in advanced level courses throughout the remainder of my, my learning experience. And so I say that to say, because I look at, I look at many people that I grew up with, and this is not boasting or bragging, but it is just the reality. I look at many people that I've grown up with and they were placed in some of those special education courses. And I think about what would my life look like had it not been for my grandmother or my mother really advocating for me. Like, what, what would my life really look like? And so I love to, she's, she's passed on as well. Uh, she passed in uh, 2011. I'd love for her. She always called me reverend or a preacher, a little preacher, right? I, I am, I, I did pastor for a while, but, but she, she was like, uh, I, I would love to have a conversation with her to, to really share kind of some of the experiences that I've had since she's passed. Uh, she was a huge advocate for me, uh, not just for 
the things that I was doing, but she was one that was a, a tremendous encourager and, and a major push in my life. And so um, I'd love to have a conversation with her. My, uh, my grandmother and her sister, she had uh, two, uh, two uh, sisters, one older, one younger. They were really, really close. And I remember going out to the country that's what we call it, <laughs> because it really is good, nothing but sticks. <laughs> um, but I remember going out to the country and like hanging with these older ladies. And just those experiences were incredibly valuable. And so uh, one of the sisters has passed on, and there's my, my Elnora uh, that's, that's left. She's 80, 80, 82 now. And I was told the, sto the story recently um, that she carries both of my books to church with her and anybody that she encounters trying to get emotional there but like any person that she comes into contact with she's like ah oh, my nephew my, my, my nephew wrote these books make sure you you get his book and so i think that's just a, a way because my grandmother and her were so incredibly close it's just a way for me to really feel my grandmother that that continued push and so that would be the person i would have the conversation with. shout out to the grandmothers i love it so now, if anyone has any questions out in the audience, please. Yes, sir. I don't mean no disrespect by asking this question. I'm going to ask an unusual question. Is this for women only? The reason why I ask that question is because we are outnumbered three to one up there and back here. There's three of you up up on stage, and there's three of us, and there's three, three ladies sitting here. I'm the only one back here, and he's the only one up there. We are outnumbered three to one, so I ask this question. Is this for women only? I know it's not for women only. That, 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 the message I got, not for women only. But sir, you bring up a very important point in that Unfortunately, usually in spaces like this or in activities, and, and I am a part of this, that it's the moms or the grandmoms or the aunties or the women who attend or bring their children. When I go to museums with my son, and I have four adult children, and every time, like, they could give tours of this entire city. I grew up in Jersey where everything cost in Philly. You want to go to the museum? It costs. The zoo? It costs. When I came here, I was like, what? You don't have to pay to get to the zoo? You don't have to pay to go to all these museums? So I always took my children. But unfortunately, two things I always noticed, sir. There were more women with their children, and there were more people who were non-color in all of these spaces. The Folk Life Festival here that's here every year. I take my children every year, and I consistently consistently see more people who don't look like me and my children, or I consistently see the women. So this is not, as I grew up with my dad and my grandparents, granddad, it's not a slight on the men, but I think it's also, it is yet another responsibility that women have to take to push. You know, I told my husband where we were coming, but I told him, we're going to dinner afterwards, and there's also a youth poetry slam at the place where we're going. You need to come out and, and sit with your son while he listens to this poetry. Only a few, only few of us come to such events, huh? And I appreciate you being here and even posing that. That's a part of diversity, too. Diversity and genders who show up for things like this. He's the only man up there. And he doesn't have to be. I mean, if you walk through this bookstore right now, you're going to see men's names. I see a few here that have written books. Yeah, they could be up here too. So it is diverse. We just have to show that. And me personally, these are my personal beliefs. So the little disclaimer here, like on the radio, these are the beliefs of, not the beliefs of San Cobra, but of Kimberly Shadow Ford, is that when men show up, it makes a difference. It's just a difference. There's a difference in a classroom when a man shows up with children. There's a difference in an atmosphere when a man shows up. And when a man with a voice like yours or like yours. If it's, if it's, not, if it's, it's not for women only. It's not. 
Good. And even if you're the only man there, sir, show up. Show up. Right. Oh, okay. I didn't mean to preach. <laughs> I didn't mean to preach. Any other questions? Anyone have any other questions? Well, I so appreciate this opportunity. When Debbie called me and she sent me a text, she said, Would you mind? I was like, Oh, no, let me go to Chat GPT and look up some questions on diversity because it's something we live. But to ask questions about them, like, and I'm like, I know look extra smart, extra intelligent. Y'all have made it so easy. So easy. So if no one else has any questions, I need to grab some books to purchase for people I know. And again, if you haven't come up to purchase, please do. Yep. So first of all, I just want to tell the community, you are, you are the perfect, perfect person. This is my Spellman sister. This is a book I've known her over 30 years. And she, you are, she got me writing poetry. We, 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 we had our foray in Spellman writing poetry. And, sharing stamp books together and whatnot and she was the perfect person and i appreciate you immensely this was very good very enlightening and very thought-provoking so i love it again we're going to be here until four o'clock so anyone wants to purchase the book we are here thank you so much for those of you to come out yes thank you so much appreciate you uh immensely thank you can I call all the sororers to the floor for a picture before LS before you leave? <laughs> if there are any Zetas in the house, aside from my LS, that would be great. Thank you. Of course.